So, let us continue our discussion on the formability testing of sheet metals. So, today we are going to discuss about uh, two important, uh, you know, rather three important subtopics relevant to formality testing of sheet metals. Okay, one is, uh, um, you know, how certain important uh, properties or parameters affect forming limit curve in general, okay, independent of any material chosen or something like that. And the second important uh, one is, uh, we are going to discuss briefly about some theoretical models, okay, available for evaluating the forming limit curve of any sheet. And then we are going to briefly uh, discuss about uh, how to detect or identify necking, okay. What are the, what are some standard uh, methods or procedures um, to evaluate uh, the, you know, or to identify necking of, a, of any sheet. This is what we are going to, these three subtopics we are going to discuss in formability testing of sheet metal. So, in the previous module, we discussed elaborately about what are the different formability testing methods available. So, it could be uh, your stretchability or deep drawability or uh, stretching cum drawing or uh, uh, it could be your uh, in plane, uh, plane strain uh, tensile test or tensile test, okay. So, limit dome height test, okay, Marciniak stretch test. So, different varieties of, you know, formability test we have studied. So, uh, now uh, all this uh, formability test is going to give you forming limit curve, which we know what is it, okay, and uh, forming limit diagram, we know these two, okay, what are the, uh, you know, what is the uh, definition of uh, forming limit curve, forming limit diagram, we know that. Now, like your stress strain behavior, okay, like uh, materials, uh, stress strain behavior, your forming limit curve, okay, will also be affected by certain important uh, properties. We will discuss one after another, but in general, okay, in general we are going to discuss. This is first one, which is uh, we know that it is a strain hardening exponent, we say n, isn't it? So, we say sigma is equal to k epsilon power n and this n is what we call it as a strain hardening exponent and uh, we have already derived a um, uh, equation relating uh, n to instability, isn't it? We have also derived before that epsilon u is equal to n, which tells the fact that uh, Okay, your uniform elongation will be affected by strain hardening exponent and the larger the n value, larger would be the your uniform elongation. Okay, so which, which in a way tells the fact that uh, your ductility can improve. Okay, so similarly, if you want to know the effect of n value on the forming limit curve, theoretically it can be estimated and uh, in general one can say that with increase in forming limit, uh, with increase in n value or forming limit improves. That means, uh, so, this is the forming limit curve, it is plotted between epsilon 1 versus epsilon 2 and uh, you will see that uh, for larger uh, n value, let us say 0 0.3, you will have forming limit curve like this, uh, but for lower n value like 0 0.15, you have a forming limit curve like this, okay. So, forming limit curve improves with increase in n value, the, but of course, the effect is uh, very clearly seen in your FLD 0, this point, no, we said FLD 0, this is very clearly seen in the, in the case of FLD 0 and in the stretching side generally, okay. So, what does it mean? That means, if a forming limit has improved, means uh, there is a large region in which you can accommodate uh, safe deformation, okay, which means your formability is uh, actually improving, okay. FLC is moving up, means uh, your forming limit is actually improving because uh, you can put uh, uh, more safe deformation to the material before it reaches the final, uh, you know, stage or uh, the final component is made, okay. But uh, the prior processing may affect uh, the quality of sheet, okay. For example, cold working, okay. So, by cold working, you strengthen material that can, uh, there are a lot of chances that your n value can reduce, which means that it is difficult to form the component, which means that it is difficult to form the component. And uh, moreover, we also know that uh, this plain strain mode of deformation. So, when you go along y axis, you reach the forming limit curve at this location, is not it? So, this particular location is actually a conservative window for, uh, you know, your forming limit, okay. So, in such type of uh, materials like code work materials, better to deform it in the uh, stretching strain path, so that you have more extra window for deforming the sheet to make the component, okay. So, this is one important parameter and uh, the effect of n can be uh, understood just by relating your uniform elongation with, uh, you know, n. 
Okay. So generally with increase in N value or forming limit is going to improve which means that formability will improve. So the next important one is called as rate sensitivity. Okay. M. So we say the strain rate sensitivity index M. Okay. This comes into picture when you go for let us say C epsilon dot power M and we have also studied that this M actually controls the uh, post necking behavior that is epsilon U minus epsilon, epsilon T minus epsilon U that particular region in the stress strain behavior it is going to affect. So uh, which means that this M is going to uh, control the growth of neck. So okay, once instability is started how quickly it can grow or how slowly it can grow will be controlled by this M value. So the, the rate sensitivity effect uh, you know it affects the rate of growth of neck. Okay. But generally you will see that this M value uh, you know does not affect okay, it will not have much effect on the tension at which uh, its maximum value is reached. Okay. So it is going to have effect after that. Okay. So now if you, these two diagrams if you see it will tell you in general about the effect of M value and you will see that higher the M value you will have better forming limit as compared to material with lower M value. This is where we were discussing about super plastic materials okay, super plastic materials or super plasticity is a property. Okay, which will have a uh, ductility of you know several hundred percentage as compared to the conventional materials right. So higher the M value you will see that uh, generally your forming limit improve mainly because uh, you can delay the growth of uh, neck. But it may so happen that uh, for materials which has got a higher M value your plain strain may not have uh, be closer to N value it will be larger than N value. You can see that lower M I am saying N here which is what we studied which we discussed in the previous uh, section FLD0. Okay, but for higher M value it may not be N actually it will be better than N. So you have better window for uh, in plane strain also. Okay. So you have a material with uh, one particular N value but the same material has got a larger M value then you may have little bit uh, more window for, for safe deformation in even in plane strain. And uh, this diagram is a well known diagram for us you are uh, uh, monitoring epsilon 1 versus epsilon 2 in the A region and in the B region. So again we are going back to the A, A region and B region we know the meaning of A region and B region right. So A region and B region are nothing but uh, your neck region and uh, the outside region neck region outside region okay A region being outside region okay. So we were discussing that you will have a thickness imperfection or the region where necking happens right. So this region is actually you can call it as B this region is you can call it as A okay. and then we said that we can give sigma 1 versus sigma 2 and see how strain evolves in these two locations. We have discussed in the previous to previous section how necking occurs in biaxial stretching. So, okay, so we consider the same geometry and we will see when necking happens at B okay, what happens to this epsilon 1 versus epsilon 2 in A and B region for two materials one with higher M and one with lower M one with higher M and one with lower M. So there are four curves here okay uh, two curves for A and B and two for two materials higher M and lower M and uh, uh, you will see that actually you have to monitor epsilon 1 versus time and epsilon 2 versus time okay these two have to be monitored and you have to plot at a common time how epsilon 1 and 2 varies at two different locations one is A and B okay. So uh, you will see that uh, for higher M okay this dotted line is for B region that is where necking is going to happen and you will see that uh, it is for A region and you will see that when compared to uh, A region B region will have unstable growth in you know your uh, strain okay unstable growth in strain especially epsilon 1 okay sudden growth unstable growth uh, after a particular stage you will see that uh, this um, your A region will try to grow in the same direction whereas you will see in the B region there is unstable growth uh, in the limit strain okay and uh, so naturally this indicates that B is the source of uh, neck. At the same time uh, you will see a lower M value material so lower M value material means this one B and you will see this A okay. So you will see that in the A region there is not much difference A region there is not much difference but in the B region you will see that uh, uh, this uh, uh, unstable increase will happen bit early so which also means that uh, you may reach limit strain little early as compared to higher M value okay. So that is the main difference between a material with higher M value and lower M value. So the, the growth of 
the evolution of A and B is going to remain same. Only thing is difference in lower M value is the unstable growth happens bit little bit early which indicates that its overall formality is going to be over because it's, it has got lower M value and you will see that the saturation happens little early whereas in the case of higher M value you will see the saturation happens little late and then there will be unstable growth. Okay. So, that is what is going to happen in A and B region with respect to M and we also studied this effect of M okay, with respect to imperfection. Okay, we derived uh, the relationship between the change in strain rate okay, with respect to M. So, previously we derived it. Okay. So, so larger the M value is better because it is going to control the post necking behavior. Okay. It will delay the growth of neck. This imperfection okay, in homogeneity we say or F which is nothing but you are that imperfection factor we said. F is nothing but we said T B by T A. Okay, T B by T A. And uh, of course, this is a very uh, theoretical in nature. Okay, so, uh, practically we do not speak anything like uh, your uh, you know uh, inhomogeneity or uh, T B by T A or uh, you have sudden change in thickness the way we have seen here. Okay, sudden change in thickness. Okay, this is T B, this is going to be your T A. Okay, this type of things we are not going to see practically, but theoretically if you want to uh, simulate what is happening in the actual material, then you introduce this F. Right. So, we also discussed that this inhomogeneity factor or F or uh, which discusses about the imperfection which defines the imp imperfection in the material is equivalent to all the imperfections in the material including structural and geometrical heterogeneities. So, we understand that intuitively like greater the imperfection, uh, greater the imperfection means uh, there is large difference between thickness in B region as compared to A region. Okay. So, you can imagine that uh, larger the imperfection means let us say uh, T A is let us say 1 mm okay, and T B is let us say 0 0.999 mm. There is another case where it is 0 0.95 and it is 1. Okay. So, that means uh, this has got uh, more imperfection. right? So, greater the imperfection you will see that lower will be the uh, limit strain because uh, the weaker region is actually very weak as compared to the other case. Okay, so, this what we know uh, conceptually schematically I have drawn this, this is with respect to large imperfection okay, which means that your forming limit is going to come down. Okay, small imperfection means a better formability is uh, obtained. So, with the large imperfections the plane strain limit strain may be less than the strain hardening index also. Okay, so, which means that uh, uh, theoretically when we say this FLD0 would be equal to N. Okay. So, as per our previous discussion it may not be in the case of materials with large imperfection. Okay. It may, that means what it may not even reach n value it may fail before that. Okay. So, other than uh, you know thickness imperfection we can also have you know practically you will see that inclusions or their local reductions in strength due to segregation of strengthening elements or texture variation these are all other situations okay, uh, which one has to take care surface roughness also plays a bigger role uh, you know uh, can be connected. So, how do you relate the surface roughness of a sheet to formability is through imperfection, is through defining this kind of F or imperfection and homogeneity factor, okay, they can be related. Okay. So, but only uh, concern here is surface roughness, the units, okay, the values are going to be very different as compared to the actual thickness of the sheet. So, this T B, T A, we are all the T B values going to discuss will be of the of the order of sheet thickness 0 0.9 and 0 0.95 whereas surface roughness you will see it is going to be a small value. But uh, in a way surface roughness can be connected to this uh, inhomogeneity factor F. Okay. So, in that case uh, other than uh, thickness heterogeneity one can see practically there are other uh, inhomogeneity in the material like inclusions or local reduction strength due to you know segregation of strengthening elements, surface roughness okay. at one particular location it is very rough. Okay, the sheet is very rough. Okay, then that means at that location imperfection could be huge, could be severe. So which means that that type of materials may have, uh, you know, less formability because of uh, presence of large imperfections. Okay, so but we should understand one particular fact that this type of changes, this geometric change, structural change, are actually uh, you know gradually available in the material. Rather in uh, our discussion, rather we actually. Uh, take sudden change in thickness. Okay, this is a sudden change in thickness. That's what we discuss. Okay, uh, which is generally not seen in materials. There will be gradual variation in uh, thickness or other uh, structural heterogeneities uh, in the sheet. So one should be uh, careful with that. This uh, anisotropy of the sheet, which we generally quantify by R. 
that is nothing but plastic strain ratio uh, small r or capital r either way is fine so true width strain divided by true thickness strain and if it is equal to 1 we say isotropic if r is not equal to 1 we say the material is anisotropic in nature right so now this this effect of anisotropy or plastic strain ratio is a little uh, uh, it actually changes from the way we use the theories some theories okay it is not very straightforward i have shown you some examples here okay because these are all theoretical forming limit curves okay we use some models and then we calculate the forming limit curve from this which means that so uh, during such calculations uh, we may assume some yield function like for example one minus yield function we have studied right so like one minus yield function which is meant for isotropic materials there are several other yield functions meant for anisotropic materials we will see some of them later in the course um, in a very summarized way we are going to discuss and uh, if that yield functions are going to change in the theoretical estimation of this forming limit curve then that will have significant influence on studying the effect of influencing the forming limit curve okay because of change in r okay so you have to uh, choose this uh, anisotropic yield function wisely uh, to study the effect of r on the forming limit curve okay so uh, in general if you see in general the existing data tells that this FLD0 from experiments, suppose you have FLD0 means again I am telling epsilon 1 versus epsilon 2 you have this is your forming limit, this particular point is FLD0 that is your epsilon 1 comma 2 in plane strain because it is a conservative location no? so we are taking it as a reference actually. So if you take that in y axis and r in x axis say let us say it varies from 0 1.53 let us say this r value okay then uh, you will see that this uh, theoretically okay you will see that this FLD0 actually uh, improves okay say for example at about 1.5 it is about uh, you know your FLD0 is about uh, you can say 0 0.2 is about it could be about 0.4 okay your major strain that means epsilon 1 is about uh, 0.4 and if it is about 2 you can see it is about 0.5 and it is about 3 it is closer to 0.6. So increase in all value generally has got a positive influence on your uh, FLD0 but uh, it also depends on the yield function as I said there are two examples given here okay. So uh, uh, of course if you want to study the effect of R value naturally you cannot use 1 minus yield function because it assumes R is equal to 1 this case okay. So naturally we have to go for other yield function which has got uh, which is meant for an isotopic yield function there are several yield for yield such yield functions one famous one is called as Hills 1948 yield criterion okay one important yield criterion is actually called as Hills 1948 yield criterion actually this one minus yield function is a case of Hills 1948 yield function we will discuss about that later okay and if you use this type of yield function okay then it will have some effect I have given that here from this particular book it is discussed more you can look into it and uh, instead of this yield function Hills 1948 if you use a higher exponent yield function okay we will see that higher exponent yield function then the effect is actually different on the forming limit curve that is given in this second diagram okay. So you will see that uh, forming limit curve for few r values I have given so r is say 2 1.5 1.5 so this is isotropic you can say you reduce it and then you increase it okay you will see that how forming limit curve is going to change on the right side of the forming limit diagram mainly on the right side of forming limit diagram you can see that epsilon 2 is only positive here of course epsilon 1 is always positive okay that is the way we draw it okay. So um, if you see that R value is going to affect in this fashion okay. So there is a large difference in uh, you know your uh, limit strain value uh, uh, when you go for uh, uh, the 45 degree line let us say balanced by axial stretching like this okay large difference 1, 2, 3, 4 this points has got large difference in forming limit but if you go closer to plane strain in this direction you will see the, the window is actually reduced the difference is actually little between this okay. So um, in Hills 1948 yield function there are some values which you can fix say for example for this particular uh, you know calculation uh, you know like uh, n value of 0.2 m value of 0 and this f value the inhomogeneity factor is kept as 0 0.98. So when you do that you get this particular type of curve. Suppose now if you change the yield function to higher exponent yield function okay what is it we will see later then the effect of R value is something like this given here you can see that again this is also positive 
uh, minor strain and of course positive major strain you will see that okay so r value has got no effect it is going to reach the same forming limit curve for different r values you can see r is equal to 0.5 r is equal to 1 r is equal to 2 r is equal to 0.5 is a circular full fill circular one so these values are coming here somewhere okay then open square is also here okay which is r is equal to 1 and uh, your uh, you know uh, filled uh, square is also here okay there is not much different there is no difference between these uh, uh, forming limit strains okay it comes with same forming limit curve it falls on the same forming limit curve and for this calculation in the deal function they have used uh, let us say a is equal to 6 there is a parameter called a which is kept as 6 and n value as 0.2 same as this m as 0 same as this and f is little bit increased instead of 0 0.98 we have used 0 0.995 okay so the effect of uh, r value is little uh, you know uh, tricky and it depends on the yield function you choose okay because different yield functions have different accuracy of predicting the forming limit strain and uh, two such examples are shown here okay so the next one there are two important parameters one is called as a temperature the other one is a strain rate okay so this of course this strain rate effect can be connected to m Okay, strain rate effect can be connected to M. So that's why I've given here two or rather three graphs. Okay, this is effect of strain rate. Okay, this is effect of temperature. So these are all strain rate values. These are temperature values given here. So when you study the effect of strain rate, temperature is kept constant. Let us say it is kept at some uh, degree centigrade. Let us say maybe 150 degree centigrade. Okay, you are keeping and then you are do doing forming uh, you know using some formability tests and then you are getting forming limit curve okay so that means the forming limit curve has been obtained at a higher temperature let us say not at room temperature maybe like warm forming or hot forming like that so in that situation if you see increasing the strain rate hmm, it is 0 0.1 per second 1 per second 10 per second okay so that means you are increasing the forming speed actually okay you are increasing the forming speed actually okay this is slowly deforming this is the highest uh, you know speed and this is in between you will see that your forming limit is actually coming down forming limit is actually decreasing the uh, difference between black red and blue if you see that for higher strain rate you have a lesser forming limit and uh, this depends on the m value of the uh, material and uh, if you take the other effect suppose you keep it at one particular strain rate okay let us say strain rate is maybe 1 per second okay strain rate is fixed at 1 per second let us say and then you are changing the temperature okay so one forming limit is for 200 degrees centigrade which is better than the other case which is say for example 125 degrees centigrade this is just a schematic i am drawing okay it may not be exactly like parallel in both the locations in both the regions one has to evaluate it and check it okay so you will see that generally increasing the temperature improves the forming limit in this fashion okay at a constant strain rate but uh, there are some examples which i have shown here you will see that practically okay they have evaluated the theoretical uh, you know a strain rate dependent forming limit diagram for this particular material one particular grade of copper if you see that uh, what are the strain rates one for example strain rate is 0 0.01 okay then 10 then 100 then 500 okay so it's more like a dynamic forming limit type okay dynamic testing type okay and you will see that so uh, the, with respect to change in strain rate your forming limit actually improves okay so probably one has to look into the materials of how is it behaving and uh, probably the strain rate is too high okay strain rate is actually too high okay to show some better effect on the forming limit okay so you can see that uh, the, the, the diamond one is here that is 10 per second okay square one is 100 per second and strain rate is this is 500 per, case, per second this is pretty high for you know your strain rate and the forming limit is um, you know quite high in that case so so it also depends on the material so one has to be a little bit careful how to understand this effect okay but otherwise generally this is the uh, shown by effect of temperature and strain rate so uh, UTS and total elongation. Total elongation effect we already know. Okay, total elongation effect is already known. So uh, 
quite naturally, you know, larger the total elongation, it is expected that forming limit will also improve. Your FLD0 again is considered as a uh, reference for us because it is in plain strain. Okay, it's a, it has got a conservative window and uh, lots of experimental data, lots of experimental data as to mean uh, taken from various, you know, data, various, uh, you know, literature. Okay, and uh, if you plot everything together with respect to the materials total elongation, that means you need to know total elongation of variety of materials and for the same material you should have data for FLD0. And if you plot it, they have an exponential fit in this fashion. So, uh, increase in total elongation will actually improve the FLD0. You can see from here to here it has improved. Just schematically I have drawn and you can see that one can fit this type of uh, uh, you know equation for that FLD0 is A exponential B epsilon t minus 0 0.3 epsilon t is nothing but total elongation FLD0 is nothing but uh, limit strain in epsilon 1 in plane strain deformation. So, this A and B can change depending on the materials that you choose. Similarly, uh, UTS can also be quantified how it is going to be uh, affect the uh, you know FLD0 and again here lots and lots of experimental data has been plotted in one graph and you will see that it is also exponential one but it is going to decay. So, increase in UTS will actually reduce the forming limit curve, will actually reduce the forming limit curve. Okay. So, FLD0 I have just uh, given a simple equation FLD0 is something but P plus B exponential minus S into sigma UTS where P, B, S all are fitting constants. They are actually fit constants one has to get after fitting after getting all the data, let us say you have 100 data for this, variety of materials are you know evaluated okay, and you are putting all the data and then you are going to fit it, then you will get this equation. Okay. So, you have to be a little bit careful when you increase the UTS of a material, in a way it is good, but uh, generally otherwise you will see that uh, its FLD can come down okay, following this particular, it is just not a linear decrease, it is exponential decay, one has to be careful. Okay, and total elongation if it improves, it is good that FLD0, there are chances that it may improve uh, by following an exponential increase. So, N, M, strain rate, temperature, then R, then you have epsilon T, sigma, UTS, okay. these are all certain important uh, properties that we get from tensile test. Okay, uh, some are actually working conditions, say for example, strain rate and temperature are actually working conditions actually. Okay, but otherwise, uh, N, M, R, epsilon, T, sigma, U, these are all material properties which will affect the uh, either the forming limit curve in both the regions, positive minus strain, negative minus strain or in FLD0. Now, this sheet thickness, if you see, it is actually not a material property, rather it is more like a geometric, you know, property of a material and it is sheet thickness decided by the application. Okay. So, and then uh, whatever sheet thickness that we are discussing in general is, is of the order of let us say maximum say 2.5, uh, 2.8 mm, 3 mm like that, not more than that. Okay. So, and what is the effect of thickness? That can be, uh, you know, explained from this particular simple schematic. Okay. So, you can see that of course, there is some data also available for you, we can check it. So, x axis is n. Uh, strain hardening exponent. Uh, this diagram is drawn not only for thickness but also for n. So, x axis is strain hardening exponent, y axis is as usual our FLD0 okay, and uh, thickness. Thickness has been found to increase in this fashion. You will see that this is 0.5 mm, 1 mm, 1.5, 2, 2.5. It means that other than n and thickness, all other properties of the material are kept constant or assumed not going to vary. And you will see that with increase in n value, 0, 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.2, 0 0.25, you will see that uh, there is a significant increase in FLD0 at any thickness. This is what we have seen before. But of course, after a particular value, let us say it is going to become saturated, it is not going to show big effect, okay, which is we have seen before. And uh, the effect of thickness, which is the main purpose of this graph, is also coinciding with the effect of n value. So, larger the thickness, you can say 0 0.51, 1 1.52, 2.5, you compare 0 0.5 and 2.5, 2.5 has got to very high okay, FLD0 as compared to 0 0.5 at any n value you pick up. You take 0 0.1, you go along this line, you will see that it has got, uh, this fellow has got about 0 0.2728, whereas this fellow has got only 0 0.1. If you pick up 0 0.2, here you have got only 0 0.22 maybe, but here you have got about almost 0 0.55. Okay, so, increase in 
thickness actually enhances the improves the FLD0. Which means that even in plain strain condition you can have a better formability if you replace 1 mm thick sheet by 2 mm thick sheet for a particular application. Okay. Assuming that n is not going to change. If n is also going to be uh, increasing then it is uh, favorable for us. Okay. So, instead of reaching this particular point in uh, 2 mm thickness you may reach this particular point in 2 mm thickness. Right, so, that is the effect. So, increasing the sheet thickness what happens actually why it is because increasing the sheet thickness you will see that the neck becomes more diffused and localization would be delayed to reach necking stage and to reach the critical depth. So, it will take some time it will delay the larger the thickness the extra thickness that you provide actually can delay the uh, you know the, uh, the necking stage and then a critical depth to reach a particular depth you know the neck as to cross the entire thickness no so that will be a little delayed so there are chances that your FLD0 or FLC0 can improve. So we also have something called pre-straining the sheet pre-straining the sheet, sheet means uh, I hope you remember an equation where we introduced epsilon naught for describing the flow stress so sigma is equal to epsilon naught plus k epsilon power n we might have seen that this in one or two problems we worked out here isn't it. So, which means that if you put k is 0 here still you will have some uh, oh sorry. So, uh, if you say sigma is equal to k epsilon naught plus epsilon power n. So, if you put your strain as 0 here so you will get some strength in the material which means that this equation will take care of any pre straining that you have in the sheet. So, now this pre straining also may have some effect on forming limit curve. Okay. So, that means you have to purposefully pre strain it and then see how it is going to affect and that is what I have given here in this schematic. So, what does that mean? That means there are three forming limit curves here. Okay. So, one is no pre strain, the black color one is no pre strain, okay, which means that the material is actually coming to you and then you are using a forming limit. Uh, you know testing method like hemispherical dome test and you are getting this forming limit curve without any pre strain. But you can purposefully pre strain it in two different ways. Let us say for example, uh, you are using uniaxial pre strain. Uniaxial pre strain means uh, uh, you take that material and you pre strain it in the strain path coinciding with uniaxial type of deformation up to a particular strain up to a particular epsilon bar let us say. So, up to a particular epsilon bar you are deforming the material and then you are evaluating the forming limit curve using any test procedure. Okay. Then you will see that in the uniaxial pre strain okay, the forming limit curve is going to change in this fashion the black color 1 to red color 1. You will see that uh, your plane strain location is actually moved okay, and then it is it looks like there is some slight upward movement of forming limit curve. And uh, the same thing if you do it or totally opposite to that suppose if you are pre straining in equibiaxial tension equibiaxial pre strain that means on the extreme right of your forming limit diagram okay then you will see that the green color one is going to be the one your black color forming limit curve is going to become green color where you will see that specifically your pre strain has moved towards the right side okay so uh, this also you can strain up to let us say one particular epsilon bar value some epsilon bar value okay but you have to pre strain in such a way that some formability exists in the material. Okay. So, you should not exhaust the forming limit fully okay. so, uh, before going for actual evaluation of forming limit curve. So, one has to do that appropriately and then get the forming limit curve one can get uh, like this, but one can uh, bring in this equation into forming limit estimation and you can virtually change this epsilon naught to get the forming limit curve. Uh, so, that is another way to get it. Okay, so, you are pre straining the sheet also has got effect on forming limit curve. So, uh, these are some important you know uh, you know your material properties and uh, uh, you know geometric uh, properties of the sheet and uh, testing uh, you know conditions like pre strain temperature uh, your strain rate okay, all are going to affect the forming limit. And of course, there is one more important uh, parameter that is nothing but your coefficient of friction mu. Okay, coefficient of uh, friction. Okay, Coulomb's coefficient of uh, friction, isn't it? Coefficient of uh, friction, or practically speaking, whether you lubricate it or not. Okay, so you use a lubricant, so lubricated condition or dry condition. 
okay loop enter condition or dry condition so this we, i think we have studied uh, in the previous section that uh, uh, generally this uh, whether you put dry a situation or a lubricated situation when you evaluate forming limit curve it is not going to affect the forming limit rather it is actually going to change the strain path only okay so that means uh, suppose if you have a forming limit uh, curve like this so epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 you have and this forming limit curve is a material property right so so if you get this particular forming limit and um, you will see that uh, when you change the friction coefficient uh, it will rather have uh, an effect like this Okay, so uh, suppose you are using dry condition, you will reach uh, the forming limit here. You will reach the forming limit here. Let us say dry condition. I am just putting, or you put any lubricant you want and you change the lubricant to some other lubricant. Okay, so we do not know the characteristics of the lubricant, we do not know mu. So, that if that is the situation, then still uh, one can study the effect. So, for one particular case, you will reach a forming limit in this case. If you change the lubrication, okay let us say lubrication is better then you may get a higher limit strain okay you may get a higher coordinate but at the same forming limit but at the same forming limit okay you may get a better epsilon 1 star and epsilon 2 star value as compared to the previous one but it will reach the same forming limit so basically it is actually changing the strain path from one beta to another beta rather than forming limit itself okay so your epsilon 1 change will get adjusted with respect to change in epsilon 2 okay accordingly you will get the uh, limit strain so individually you will see limit strain may change but then it will finally lead to the same forming limit that is why we always say that the forming limit is actually a material property so that is the effect of mu um, there are a lot of discussion in the subject about effect of mu but in general this is the way it is going to work so after studying all these uh, parameters let us quickly uh, in a very summarized way let us discuss some important theoretical estimation of forming limit curve okay theoretical models okay uh, we will uh, there are several theoretical models uh, you know uh, simple uh, ones we have already discussed one or two before uh, two with complex ones okay which will give you a forming limit curve theoretically okay of course all have to be validated by doing some formable t-test at lab scale to get the forming limit and compare it you have to validate it if you go for a theoretical estimation of forming limit curve, you will see that uh, uh, these forming limit models can be divided into two parts. One is your analytical model, other one is semi-empirical models. So, analytical models are based on, uh, you know, some physics, okay, you know, like you put lot of equations, we already derived one, isn't it? You put some conditions and then, uh, you know, apply some boundary conditions and then see. Finally, you will get uh, same epsilon 1 star, comma epsilon 2 star and then change the beta values or alpha values in the equations to get the forming limit curve for the entire list of strain paths we study. So, that is analytical models. There are semi-empirical models. Semi-empirical models means basically uh, models based on some fitting, okay, basically models based on some curve fitting, okay. So, like the way we studied the effect of UTS and uh, total long, uniform elongation, total elongation, right. So, similarly, you can also uh, estimate, uh, you can also estimate forming limit curve or data points in that using semi-empirical models. So, first let us see few analytical models, uh, simple ones only we are going to discuss and we are not going to derive the entire equation here, rather we are going to discuss all these things in a very conceptual way, okay. What is the basics behind it that way only instead of theoretical derivations. So, a lot of derivations are available in textbooks and papers, one can look into it or any plasticity book can be referred for that. So, when you come to analytical model, the first one is basically we already studied for tensile instability that is uh, your consideration condition, okay. And we know that any material which undergoes plastic deformation, there are actually two domains in that. One is a stable plastic straining domain, other one is a unstable plastic straining domain. Stable plastic straining domain means hardening is influenced, okay, on the tension force, okay, but not the cross section reduction, okay. That is going to be actually uh, your uh, initial part of plastic deformation, which we say it as a stable plastic deformation. And then once you reach one particular stage, after that if you see it is going to be unstable plastic straining, if you see in that location, in that region, the material hardening okay, cannot compensate the decrease in tensile force due to severe reduction in sample cross section area. Okay. So, your hardening is actually going to help the tensile force to improve in the first zone, but in the second zone you will see that the hardening actually is not going to 
compensate the decrease in load okay which is going to actually happening because of a significant reduction in area of cross section this finally will lead to a typical stress strain behavior which we have seen so now given that situation this transition is going to happen at one particular place okay from stable plastic response to unstable okay and at that stage we can say that it can be said that onset of necking corresponds to maximum tension force and it can be written mathematically as df is equal to 0 and uh, simple derivation we have already shown it can be shown that 1 by sigma d sigma by d epsilon is equal to 1 okay or d sigma by d epsilon is equal to sigma and if you put this particular power law equation and then we if you derive it we can show that uh, epsilon u is equal to n or we can say epsilon bar is equal to n it means that as per this condition for a sheet obeying this particular law okay we found that uh, the material starts to neck when the strain equals a strain hardening exponent of that particular material and we have also seen that if you do not use this equation if you use pre strain equation this equation can be modified by including uh, some factor of pre strain into it is not it some factor of pre straining into it and if you, you will see that if you include some pre strain value it is going to be a subtraction that is going to play a role here and hence you will see that your forming limit uh, your, uh, your instability strain or necking strain is going to actually decrease right that we have already studied. So, this is one important analytical model that people use to estimate your tensile instability. Now, the next important model is called as a swift model. Okay. This, uh, this swift model can be used to obtain limit strains epsilon 1 star and 2 star by using consider a criteria n in biaxial tension side. Okay. In, instead of tensile instability, you can apply this in biaxial tension by taking a sheet element loaded along two perpendicular directions. So, you take a sheet element okay, okay, and uh, you load it along two perpendicular direction which means biaxial tension okay, and you apply this consider a condition, condition. So, after that what do you do? Apply consider a criterion in each direction okay, along one direction let us say along two direction you apply this particular condition and uh, of course, one can put similar condition your df is equal to 0 you can say similarly you can put conditions on both the directions and if you assume the same power hardening law sigma is equal to k epsilon power n you will get two important expression one for epsilon 1 star and epsilon 2 star right. So, epsilon 1 star and 2 star are nothing but the data points on the forming limit curve okay this is epsilon 1 star and 2 star another epsilon 1 star another epsilon 1 star another epsilon 1 star right so this is a general equation one can get the expression one can get for epsilon 1 star and 2 star okay and here you will see that in this equation okay uh, you are sigma 1 there is sigma 2 sigma 1 sigma 2 other these are actually principal stresses and uh, you will see that there is one more the two more one is your f this f is not your uh, inhomogeneity factor rather this f is actually yield function Okay, this is the same f that we use in normality condition d epsilon ij is equal to dou f by dou sigma ij into d lambda that f is nothing but this yield function and this n is nothing but our own strain hardening exponent. Okay, so, you will see that uh, now this limit strain epsilon 1 star and 2 star that you get using this swift model is simple to use, but it depends on the yield function only it depends on yield function only and of course, it depends on only one material property that is n that is because you are going to use this particular hardening law and it does not have any other uh, you know forming parameter only n is available. So, this becomes a function of n. So, now what we can do is uh, you can use a variety of yield functions in place of this f and uh, you can uh, you know uh, derive this uh, equations actual equations for epsilon 1 star and 2 star and finally, you will see that epsilon 1 star and 2 star could be a function of your uh, n which is already there maybe strain rate sensitivity index and of course, plain st plastic strain ratio also you can include because you may use an isotropic yield function and of course, it will be a function of alpha so that you can get uh, for different alphas uh, what are the forming limit uh, strains. Okay. And uh, if you use Hill's 1948 yield function okay, this is uh, the famous uh, you know yield function if you use that equation in place of f okay, then you will get uh, a nice epsilon 1 star and 2 star expression okay, and you will see that as I uh, just now said it becomes a function of r and alpha and n. So, of course, the strain hardening law does not have m. So, m fellow this m fellow will not come here. Okay, so, this is a simple expression you will see that 1 plus r into 1 minus alpha into 1 minus 2 r by 1 plus r into alpha plus alpha square divided by 1 plus 
r into 1 plus alpha into 1 minus 1 plus 4 r plus 2 r square divided by 1 plus r square alpha plus alpha square into n. Similarly, epsilon 2 can be estimated from this. 2 star can be estimated from this equation. So, what are the material properties you have? There is only one quantity plastic strain ratio which quantifies the degree of anisotropy. There is one parameter n strain hardening exponent. Other than that, you have only alpha to change the stress ratio or to change beta. So, now for a constant n and r, okay, let us say r I am going to fix as maybe let us say 1.5, okay, and n I am going to change let us say 0 0.2, 0 0.25, and 0 0.3, then one can get variety of values of epsilon 1 star and 2 star for different alphas. So, alpha also is going to uh, you know change from the leftmost side okay, for the uh, you know the, the negative minus strain to positive minus strain. So, I can get different values of alpha which already defined. We already discussed 5 different alphas right. So, all these alphas can be substituted here and you can get a forming limit curve. So, by calculating epsilon 1 star and 2 star for different alpha we get the whole necking limit curve or forming limit curve. Okay, this uh, equations are simple to use because it depends on uh, only one the material property, two material property R and N and which means that if R is equal to 1, if you put R is equal to 1 in both the equations that it will turn out to be for forming limit is meant for isotropic sheets okay, for the same n value. So, you can take R is 1.0 and you can get the effect of 0 0.2, 0 0.25, 0 0.3. So, then the entire value data forming limit curve is for isotropic sheets with the different n value. So, this model is easy to use and then similarly there is another model called as the Hills model. Okay, and uh, this Hills model it is going to assume something which we already discussed. In uniaxial tension test, we have also proved that the localized necking develops along a direction which has got some orientation with the loading direction, correct. That we have discussed uh, when we try to prove that in biaxial stretching there is no definite theta and that is why your uh, necking is not going to be rapid, rather something is actually delay the necking process, right. So, that is why it is creating difference between experiments and maximum tension line on the right hand side of forming limit diagram, correct. So, at that time we have shown that there is a definite theta existing for new axial mode of deformation, right. I think we have put uh, you know alpha value as some value as one particular value and then we got uh, theta. Similarly, we did for plane strain also. So, localized necking develops along a direction which has got some orientation with the loading direction, okay. So, but Hill's model assumes that the necking direction coincides with the direction of zero extension and straining in the neck is due to only sheet thinning. Okay. So, uh, it is going to assume that there is one particular you know direction of zero extension and moreover because of that in the neck region only sheet thinning is going to happen and uh, further it is going to deform, it is going to fracture. Okay. And uh, with this assumption one can evaluate you know epsilon 1 star and 2 star and finally, you will get epsilon 1 star and 2 star as uh, this particular equation you will see dou f by dou sigma 1 divided by dou f by dou sigma 1 plus dou f by dou sigma 2 into n. Similarly, epsilon 2 star is dou f by dou sigma 2 divided by dou f by dou sigma 1 plus dou f by dou sigma 2 into n whereas, f is our own yield function and uh, if you combine these two equations you will get this particular equation. This equation is already known to us is not it epsilon 1 star plus 2 star is equal to n. So, if you add these two it will lead to our own the previous equation which will give you maximum tension line, which will give you maximum tension line. Okay. So, now in this equation as per this equation you can simply say that your FLC estimated from this Hills model above equation does not depend on yield function. Okay. So, though you are using yield function here finally, okay, you will see it is going to depend only on the n value and nothing much is going to happen and this equation epsilon 1 star plus 2 star is equal to n is nothing but it is going to cut your y axis at n value. Okay, epsilon 2 is 0, say epsilon 1 star would be nothing but your n value. Okay, so, as per this equation, it is going to depend only on n value and not the yield function at all. Okay, that is what Hill's model is going to tell you and uh, this method is already uh, discussed by us slightly uh, before, uh, the concept is already introduced to you. Okay, Marciniak Kusensky model, this model is in short, in short called as MK model, this is very famously used to predict the forming limit curve of any sheet material in this particular subject and uh, 
this particular model basically assumes that necking is generally initiated by geometrical or structural heterogeneity in the material that we already know that we already introduced this okay you have geometrical you know defects okay like for example sheet thickness change suppose you take a sheet of 2 mm thickness we say okay we take a sheet of uh, let us say 2 mm thickness but it's not going to be 2 mm everywhere so it, here it could be 1.98 1.99 1.985 here it could be 2 2.01 2.22 2.05 so it can vary within a small region we say 2 mm plus or minus some value it can change that sheet hetero thickness change itself is sufficient to create a thinning severe thinning at one particular location which can lead to significant necking localized necking okay so that is the whole idea here of telling sheet thickness changes of course lattice defects are already there they are called as structural defects okay so as per this particular uh, theory we are going to assume a sudden change in thickness okay to estimate limit strains this particular figure this we already introduced to you however we should uh, know that the such type of changes is not actually true in practice it's going to be a gradual change in practice that's why i given you different values here so it's not going to be a sudden change but this is the simplest choice we have this is the simplest choice that's why we always say that uh, the thickness difference is equivalent to the thickness difference that you are going to create the imperfection severity that you are going to create is equivalent to all the imperfections in the material okay so that's the meaning here so this is the simplest choice we have uh, the simplest choice is given in this diagram. So, this is a geometrical assumption of MK model in a sheet. So, A and B belongs to the same sheet, okay, which has got same material properties, but only thing is your B region has got lesser thickness, let us say TB when compared to TA, okay. And um, your uh, one direction and two direction is going to coincide with the principal directions as per this particular one to start with. So, sigma 1 is going to act in this direction, sigma 2 is going to act in this direction. So, if you know TB and TA, you can create this F. This F is nothing but our inhomogeneity factor, your uh, uh, non-homogeneity factor, which you already introduced, the TB by TA. Sometimes in the biaxial stretching, when we discussed about, we also introduced F0, which means that TB0 divided by TA0. That means the initial one. So, your F can change during the course of deformation. That is what we were discussing. So, we introduced this F. Okay. So, we introduced this uh, F, which is nothing but TB by TA. So, now what we can do is you assume that uh, let us take a case where you can, uh, you can you can you can do let us say modeling of this. So, you have some equations for all this. Okay, We can put lot of conditions to it and then you know like you can find out some equations and in that equations or in any other way assume that uh, we are going to monitor okay, epsilon 1 A and B. Okay, Epsilon 1 that means along this direction along one direction okay in a and in b you are going to monitor these two that means your major strain in a and b can be monitored okay so now uh, we are going to say that when this particular ratio when this particular ratio reaches a critical value for example 10 okay i am writing epsilon 1 b uh, epsilon 1 b divided by epsilon 1 a is greater than 10 then i am going to say that uh, localization occurred in b okay which is an indication of onset of necking Okay, which is indication of uh, your necking of that particular sheet. So, I am going to simply monitor epsilon 1b with respect to epsilon 1a. Okay, once it reaches 10 or just crosses 10, so I am going to say that uh, the material is going to neck. Okay, at that stage, at that stage, I am going to pick up uh, epsilon 1 star and 2 star closer to b, probably in a. Okay, closer to b, probably in a. Okay, to call it as a limit strains that you have to do this exercise you have to do it for all the strain parts let us say all the beta values okay you will get to forming limit strains forming limit curve or neck curve okay so you will this is what i have depicted in this particular diagram you will see that uh, you are monitoring epsilon 1a and 1b okay and um, you will see that uh, in the a region the a region that is you are outside the neck region okay you are going to have some saturation Whereas in the B region, see you see that it will keep on growing. Okay, and one particular location you will see that if you find out the ratio, then it will reach 10. At that time, you pick up epsilon 1a star. You pick up epsilon 1a star. Okay, and there will be a corresponding epsilon 2a star, and these two together will form one coordinate in the forming limit curve. 
ok that is what I have written here and by changing the strain ratio from 0 to 1 ok. So, again uh, we are looking at uh, 0 to 1 ok let us say this is epsilon 1 this is epsilon 2 uh, 0 to 1 strain ratio 0 means in plane strain ok to 1 that is balanced by axial stretching you can get different epsilon 1 star and 2 star and you can connect all these values ok. Let us say you have 4 different cases here and you will get uh, the forming limit curve on the positive major strain of FLD like this 1, 2, 3 you are going to get uh, this brown color line which we are going to call it as a forming limit curve ok. So, in this zone of FLD that is in biaxial stretching side uh, in this side uh, the orientation of the geometrical non homogeneity that is this thickness reduction this orientation uh, this orientation you see that this orientation with respect to principal direction is assumed to be same during the entire deformation to start with it is same ok that means uh, this orientation is like this this orientation is exactly perpendicular to your one direction and that is going to remain same ok throughout the course of uh, deformation that is what is uh, given here ok. So, now you have got a forming limit curve on the right hand side of your forming limit diagram by changing by monitoring your uh, epsilon 1 a and epsilon 1 b ok and you have got various values and you have got this particular forming limit curve. Now, who will get a forming limit curve on the left hand side? The left hand side maximum tension line if it is sufficient for us then that is sufficient which I already discussed. But if you want to use this MK model then there has to be some slight change in the concept. So, here what the issue here is you are going to monitor the same strain pattern in the same way by changing the orientation like this. I have just given a schematic here the same A region, B region this also A region, but you will see that uh, the orientation of imperfection is at some angle let us say phi with respect to the principal directions 1 and 2 that is why I have created 1 dash and 2 dash this 1 dash 2 dash are actually local coordinates for this imperfection. The original coordinate is actually 1 and 2 ok. So, this is what you are going to do it on the left hand side. So, MK model can be extended to negative minus strain region of FLD that means on the left hand side by having some orientation for the imperfection with respect to principal directions. So, in this figure this model is actually called as a Hutchinson and Neal model in short it is called as HN model ok. It is MK model, but it is modified one for the left hand side and it is called as a Hutchinson Neal model. So, I will not go into the equations and discussion only thing is I have written two important equations here one how this phi this this angular orientation is going to change with strain. The orientation of imperfection varies with strain as per this particular expression tan phi plus d phi is equal to 1 plus d epsilon 1 a divided by d epsilon 2 a into tan phi and f which you are going to assume T b by T a may also vary as per this particular law f by f naught is equal to d epsilon 3 b minus d epsilon 3 a where d epsilon 3 is nothing but you are uh, incremental thickness strain incremental thickness strain in B and A region B and A region here also A region A region. So, this is A region ok. So, what is F by F naught? F is your current value of your inhomogeneity factor and F naught is your initial value of inhomogeneity factor uh, inhomogeneity factor. So, this ratio actually depends on this particular one ok. So, of course, one can apply a lot of theories uh, you know different uh, you know sets of equations in it finally, you may get one a simple model to calculate the forming limit curve on the left hand side also. So, that one can refer these books or other papers to get to into it. So, now there are some semi empirical models. What are the semi empirical models? These semi empirical models are handy ok. The semi empirical models are actually handy in nature. You can get a quick guess of what is the forming limit curve of these materials any sheet grade materials. Of course, they have some constraints and lot of validation is required to use that in actual practice, but this will be useful for us to quickly use in shop floor ok. Instead of too many calculations and uh, you know effect of parameters all those things on the theoretical estimation of forming limit curves, one can use this simple empirical models to get uh, the forming limit curve. So, I have introduced uh, three important uh, uh, semi empirical equations there are few more available in actual thing, but uh, one can look into it if you are interested. So, one is the first one is called Keeler Brazer model Keeler Brazer model this Keeler Brazen model again like the previous examples it is going to evaluate estimate FLD 0. It is going to find out FLD 0 in percentage. The equation is 23.3 plus 14.13 into T 
whole into n by 0 0.21 where t is your our standard thickness of the sheet and n is the strain hardening exponent t is the sheet thickness and n is the strain hardening exponent okay so uh, as per this equation uh, your fld0 depends only on n and t only on n and t and this equation is valid only for thickness less than 3 mm thickness and that is what we are also discussing okay and uh, once you get fld0 so again uh, you will see that fl epsilon 1 epsilon 2 so you get fld0 from this uh, simple equation you can put any t and n let us say n values may be like uh, 0 0.15 and t as let us say 1.5 mm so you substitute it you will get fld0 and it will be a one point in this particular forming limit curve so now if you want to get the left hand side of the forming limit curve and the right hand side you can use these two equations okay so left hand side of the equation if you see that of the fld if you want to get data points you can use f epsilon 1 is equal to fld0 minus epsilon 2 so whatever value you are getting here uh, you subtract epsilon 2 virtually take different epsilon 2 values keep subtracting it you will get epsilon 1 so you may get a curve like this and on the right hand side also same thing can be utilized 1 plus fld 0 into 1 plus epsilon 2 power 0 0.5 minus 1 so epsilon 2 you can vary virtually okay on the right hand side of the fld and you will get epsilon 1 so you may get a curve like this so finally you will see that you will get the entire forming limit curve using this there are other models which are little bit more complex they try to bring in you know more material properties into it say for example this particular model uh, they evaluate they use uh, they evaluate again epsilon 10 means fld0 that means epsilon 1 in plain strain mode of deformation you can calculate it from this equation you will see that uh, the equation is actually uh, cubic form okay a into epsilon uh, 1 minus n cube plus b into epsilon 1 not minus n square plus c e into epsilon 1 0 minus n minus 10 into m t equal to 0 ok. So, you will see that here you have a b c are actually fit constants for the material and the material properties are actually you have n strain hardening exponent you have brought in m also strain rate sensitivity index and of course sheet thickness is also there ok. So, for a particular value of n m and t ok one can get a b c such that you will get epsilon 10 to satisfy this particular equation ok. So, from this you can get fld 0. So, it is done ok. So, then uh, a modification in this is also provided and uh, here you will see that uh, uh, this is a cubic form of equation the same a b c are there you have a strain hardening exponent you have m t other than that they have brought in r value also they have brought in r value the form of the equation is almost same the cubic part is same, the square part is also same and this part is also same ok minus you have uh, m t in place of before m t you have uh, r ok. So, if you put r is equal to 1 ok you may check whether it may lead to the same equation or similar equation where r is your plastic strain ratio you can check it. So, these are certain semi empirical models available for us ok. So, now uh, analytical models are done. Uh, semi-numerical models are done there are various other analytical models available so there are damage theories damage models which can be used to get the sheet fracture strains uh, so after necking one can go for fracture strains also ok so that fracture limit curve can also be obtained ok then one can go for this kind of semi-empirical models which are very handy and useful in actual industry practice but validation is important for us ok then the last uh, sub part in this particular module before we go into problem is basically making identification methods ok. So, uh, you are doing deformation and you are identifying necking, but there should be some standard ways of identifying that yes necking has happened or not ok. So, because I may say that you know like necking has happened somebody else may say that no no necking has not happened let us deform it by another point to mm or something to enter into the onset of necking. So, how do you uh, you know identify neck? ok you know practically ok. So, experimentally of course, of course you can show you can see the sheet and then uh, you can say that yes necking has happened or you can touch it and see but of so which 
which is not uh, actually possible in theoretical estimation. So, how do you identify nickel? So, there are uh, three, four methods available, but I am going to explain you only two methods which are simple to implement. One is uh, called a slope method or you can measure thickness reduction rate in this, measuring thickness reduction rate in this. So, what do you do in this? Actually, you have to follow this particular graph. This graph is between epsilon in general strain with respect to time, uh, with respect to this is actually time, uh, not thickness of the sheet, it is actually time here. So, basically you are going to monitor strain throughout the entire process duration, that is the meaning here. Okay. So, um, what do you do here is, so let us say for example, at one particular sheet element, okay, we can monitor epsilon 1 and 2 and 3. Okay. Let us assume that we can monitor epsilon 1 and 2. So, numerically you are doing, you are getting epsilon 1 and 2, a continuous change in epsilon 1 and 2 with respect to time. Epsilon 1 versus time, we already discussed epsilon 2 versus time is obtained. For the same time interval, epsilon 1 and 2 will give you epsilon 3. From volume constancy, you can get epsilon 3 also. So, now if epsilon 3 is known, then you can get right, you can evaluate thickness reduction rate you can get thickness reduction rate. Okay. Thickness reduction means how much thickness is reduced with respect to a particular time. So, that can be plotted with respect to time itself. That is what I have shown here. Okay. So, uh, there are three curves in this. One is your epsilon 1, which is nothing but your major strain. Other one is epsilon 2, which is nothing but your minor strain. And then you can see there is one plot for uh, thickness strain, but from thickness strain you can get a thickness reduction rate and it will look like this, this curve, red color curve. This red color curve is nothing but thickness reduction rate curve. So, there are three thickness reduction rate. So, now what you can do is like you can draw uh, the slope lines, okay. you can draw this slope lines from the initial part of the thickness reduction curve and the unstable part of the thickness reduction curve and you can find out this intersection point here, you can see this black color line and this black color line are actually slope lines for this part and this part and they meet here this intersection point is finding it is going to be very important for us. Okay, This intersection point is a point at which strain localization happens and that is why there is a sudden increase in your thickness reduction rate and uh, there will be a corresponding value of epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 which you are going to call it as epsilon 1 star and 2 star. This epsilon 1 star and 2 star is nothing but you are forming limit strain at that particular beta value, strain path or strain ratio. So, you have to repeat it for various beta values and monitor the same thickness reduction rate okay, and the corresponding epsilon 1 and 2 where this intersection point happens would be your epsilon 1 star and 2 star. You can get the forming limit curve for the entire uh, material, for the entire material. Okay. So, basically you take a sheet, one particular strain path, you have to monitor epsilon 1, 2 and 3. Okay and then from epsilon 3 you can get thickness reduction rate and uh, you will see that this slope if you draw for the stable and unstable region it will have an intersection point. The intersection point is going to tell you which epsilon 1 and 2 you have to pick up to call it as epsilon 1 star and 2 star which is nothing but your limit strain of that particular beta value and you can change it, change the beta value to get different limit strain values. This is one way. There is another method which is also easy that is called time dependent method. This is a similar one, but a slightly different. Okay. You will see that in this method, you have to choose two locations. One location is a neck zone, a neck region, which I have schematically drawn here. This is a neck, uh, this is a neck portion. This entire constriction is actually called as your neck. Okay. So, it may not be like this, but I am just showing a case. Okay. So, you have to choose one element or a, or a location where you can measure strain in the neck zone and immediate, immediately just in the vicinity of the neck zone or just outside it, you have to choose another location. Let us, let us call that this is N and this is O. Okay. N is a location or element in the neck region, O is a element or location just outside the neck region. Again, what you need to do is you have to monitor strain in that location and strain rate in that uh, two locations. So, I have drawn a graph between uh, in y axis you have epsilon 1 and epsilon 1 dot. Epsilon 1 dot means strain rate, major strain rate and of course, this is uh, your time, process time. Okay. So, uh, 
you will get two curves actually. These two curves are represented by epsilon 1 neck, epsilon 1 outside. Okay, you can call it as epsilon 1 n, this is epsilon 1 o. Okay, that means epsilon 1 neck is nothing but how epsilon 1 changes with the time in this particular location, neck zone. Okay, epsilon 1 outside means same epsilon 1, how is it going to vary just outside the neck zone that is this O region. So, this, these two are monitored and we already discussed that the, in the outside region it has to saturate actually after some time. You can see that both the regions are equally deforming and after some time you are going to have saturation in epsilon 1 outside location, but in the neck location it is going to unstably increase, it is going to unstably increase. But only thing which you have to be cautious is which location you are going to pick up for this O that is very important because next zone you can somehow identify because it is a small constriction it may develop or there will be uh, you know some severe contour deformation contour may develop ok. So, but this outside region which location you want to choose this region or this region or this region one has to be very very careful ok. So, now these two curves are obtained. So, now what you do is you have to get how this d epsilon 1 outside changes with the time that will give you this red color curve. So, that is why I have written d epsilon by dt. Basically, it is d epsilon by dt, it is strain rate only. Okay, strain rate only, major strain outside. Outside location, whatever major strain you have, variation for this variation, you are going to get the slope and you plot it with respect to time. So, epsilon 1 outside, how is it changing with respect to time? You will see that at one particular instant, it will keep on increasing, at one particular instant, it will be, it will be reaching a maximum or a peak and then it will decay actually and then it will decay. So, this peak value is what you have to pick up. So, the maximum point is identified as the stage of localized necking. At this particular time, the corresponding major and minor strains denote forming limit strain. So, you can draw a vertical line to hit this portion, which is nothing but your epsilon 1, okay. And then the corresponding epsilon 2 together will give you a forming limit strain, okay. So, uh, to keep it little bit more conservative, you can also uh, choose the outside region also as a reference and you can get epsilon 1 star and 2 star, okay. So, if this, this diagram is give, going to give you only the variation major strain and major strain rate, but then if you know the stage at which you have to pick up epsilon 1 and call it as epsilon 1 star, at the same stage you can get epsilon 2 star for that particular location to keep it more conservative better to refer the outside region as a location for evaluation, okay. This is another way to, uh, to locate your necking stage, okay. So, we stop here and then we will discuss further in the next topic. Mm -hmm.